Hi, I'm Laura Waters. I'm a doctor from London and I'll be talking about resistance considerations when choosing the optimal treatment regimen. These are my disclosures. I shall be covering basic principles of resistance, some considerations for first line suppress switch, early and later lines of treatment failure, and finishing with some closing thoughts. Starting with the basic principles. We can think about resistance tests in different ways, genotypic or phenotypic, looking for transmitted or acquired resistance, sequencing RNA or DNA, and finally Sanger population or next generation sequencing. Starting with genotypic versus phenotypic. Now genotypic testing, nucleotide sequencing, looking for nucleotide changes that confer amino acid changes that are associated with loss of drug susceptibility is the standard resistance testing, but you need to know what you're looking for. Phenotypic testing, taking actual virus and seeing the impact of mutations on drug susceptibility in vitro is what helps interpret and shape genotypic algorithms. But the guidelines are clear for routine clinical practice, genotypic testing is what we do, and that's a line from the DHHS guidelines. Transmitted resistance, where somebody acquires HIV with mutations that already confer drug resistance or acquired, where resistance develops for the first time in an individual where there's been viral replication in the presence of suboptimal drug concentrations. Transmitted resistance is the reason we do baseline testing. Now, in most parts of the world, there's been a steady decline in the rates of transmitted resistance. This is data from Europe. And here we see transmitted drug resistance rates from 1995 out to 2019. And for total top left, protease inhibitor top right, NRTI bottom left and NNRTI bottom right, there's been a steady decline in transmitted resistance over time. Looking bottom left at the NRTIs, before 95, we only had NRTIs and they were being used as sequential mono and dual therapy. But after 95, we're able to protect them by combining them with drugs from other classes. And that's why you see that particularly marked decline in that class. This is data from Germany looking at people with seroconversion, a great time to do resistance tests because viral loads tend to be very high and more likely to successfully amplify them. But also, Mutations that confer a fitness disadvantage will disappear over, the over time as the virus reverts back to wild type. So the earlier do you do a resistance test, the more accurate it will be, though transmitted resistance does persist longer than acquired. What we see here, pick out some drugs, lamivudine, just about half a percent with transmitted resistance, tenofovir, most of the mutations confer only low level resistance lower rates of darunavir resistance than to other protease inhibitors. And although NNRTI mutations are fairly common, the impact varies according to which drug. And certainly if you pull out the individual mutations, the rate of transmitted duravirine resistance is about half a percent. However, 184B or I will be more common in people recently exposed to PrEP. This is data from the 56 Dean Street Clinic in London, looking at more than a thousand new diagnoses 5% who'd had recent PrEP, and the people who were PrEP exposed had lower viral loads and were more likely to have a viral load below 200, but 30% 184V or I compared to 1% in the non-PrEP exposed group, K65R uncommon in both. Remarkably similar data from New York, more than 3,500 new diagnoses, 2% prior PrEP exposure with a 29% 184V or I rate to HIV diagnosis, compared to 2% in the non-PREP exposed group, but again, K65R uncommon. Integrated resistance tends not to be um, monitored as much in these resistance cohorts. This is some data from the UK though, showing major integrated resistance mutations were not present at high variant frequency defined as 20% or more, but about 4% had low frequency major resistance. That's in the 2 to 10% range, though the clinical importance is not certain. That's why at the moment where it's specified, guidelines don't recommend routine integrase sequencing. They recommend baseline resistance testing, sequencing reverse transcriptase and protease, with DHHS and BEVA giving some specific examples where you might consider integrase baseline testing. For example, in someone who's had long-acting cabotegravir prep in the past. WHO more pragmatic, consider resistance testing where feasible, 
but they do say where the population prevalence of NNRTI resistance is more than 20, 10%, these should not be used first line. This paper from the US questions whether we even need to do baseline resistance testing and concludes with integrase based first line regimens, baseline genotype offers minimal benefit and is not cost effective. So do we need to test? In my opinion, yes, and certainly those guidelines I showed you agree. Population resistance surveillance is critical, especially as we roll out more PrEP using drugs from classes that we also use for treatment. And how can you optimise an individual's treatment, for example, switching to a lower barrier regimen, switching to injectables, if you don't have that critical baseline information? RNA or DNA. So typically we sequence RNA, people with detectable plasma viral loads. But there's increasing evidence for DNA, proviral or intracellular genetic material for people with low or undetectable viral loads. What the guidelines say is that there's a lack of evidence for proviral DNA testing. It might provide some additional information, but it might miss historic resistance. EAC specify it may also detect clinically irrelevant resistance mutations and is very clear it's not currently recommended. And Beaver says the clinical significance is not clear at present. And then our classic Sanger population versus next generation sequencing. So this is a typical analogy for Sanger sequencing, that it only detects the tip of the iceberg. So you need to have more than 20 percent of your viral population harboring a given mutation for Sanger to find it. Next generation sequencing detects minority variants down to a threshold as low as 0.1 percent. But does this give us any additional clinical benefit? What we do know is there are a number of studies showing minority NNRTI resistance predicts NNRTI treatment failure, and top right is the most recent paper published just last week. In START, next, genera next generation sequencing showed, like that UK cohort, there were no integrase resistance mutations above a 20% threshold. But you can see from the different shades of grey that using next generation sequencing detected more people with resistance and the lower that threshold was, the more likely resistance was. But again, what was the clinical utility beyond those NNRTI cohorts? So what we don't know, what's the global epidemiology of low level resistance? What's the clinical impact beyond NNRTIs? What's the appropriate threshold? Will it differ for different classes or even different agents? And if you want to read more, this reviews an excellent summary of what we do and don't know about low abundance drug resistant variants. First line considerations. So we typically divide drugs into high and low barrier regimens. I won't go through this in great detail. What this illustrates is our NNRTIs um, and our first generation integrases, raltegravirs in this table, but elvitegravir is similar. You see high rates of virologic, uh, high rates of resistance amongst the people who experience virologic failure. So real pivarine in Echo and Thrive, for example, around about two thirds of people with virologic failure had NNRTI and NRTI resistance. Boosted PIs fare better, though you see differences with atazanavir, for example, being associated with lower, but still some rates of NRTI resistance, whereas with darunavir, you don't see PI or NRTI resistance. And our second generation integrase is also demonstrating a high barrier first line with, in general, no integrase or NRTI resistance of first line treatment failure. However, most first line options are high barrier these days anyway. So looking at DHHS, Beaver and WHO, exclusively high barrier regimens recommended first line. EACs mainly high barrier, but also raltegravir and draverine. So what do these guidelines say about what we should start? If you don't have a baseline resistance test, generally they consider a second generation integrase and a boosted PI to be interchangeable. So all recommend Bictegravir, Dolutegravir or boosted Darunavir with a Tenofovir and either Emtricitabine or Lamivudine backbone. DHHS specifies to avoid NNRTIs, Dolutegravir, Lamivudine dual therapy and Abacavir. So those high barrier three drug regimens are all considered suitable if you don't have baseline resistance information. What about suppressed switch? Now, there's lots of studies looking at suppressed switch. I'm not going to go through any individually. And recently, we tend to see a lot of studies where people on effective regimens switch to effective regimens. And the conclusion is that they're effective. 
But the principles we've learned from switch studies over the years is the importance of reviewing old resistance tests, though the importance of that resistance might decline over time. So cohorts showing that the impact of a 184 on dolutegravir and mivudine therapy seems to reduce over time. And if it's an old mutation, it may no longer be important. I think we need to understand that better. Caution when switching from high to low barrier regimens in the exemplar study there is switch Merck, where people randomized to switch to raltegravir had inferior outcomes compared to those who stayed on lapinavir-ritonavir, both with a two NRTI backbone because of the presence of NRTI resistance in some participants. And be cautious because a lot of modern switch studies lump together historical genotypic and baseline, um, sorry, historical RNA and baseline DNA resistance. So if you look at a lot of the Bictavi suppressed switch studies, most of the baseline resistance is based on proviral DNA sequencing. And I refer you back to the guidelines for what they say about that. If you see someone with no baseline resistance test, then thinking about things like the likely country of acquisition, how many years since the resistance was detected, what's their antiretroviral history, and knowing what resistance is most likely at failure of any given regimen. And someone who's been suppressed for many years on low barrier art, it may be reasonable to assume they don't have major resistance. Also, there's going to be the balance of risk if you need to switch away from a boosted PI for insurmountable drug interactions, for example, that's clearly going to tip the balance in favour of switching. Sometimes people say there's no baseline resistance test available. We cannot switch to, for example, dolutegravir and mivudine. But that may not have stopped them switching someone from efavirenz to ropivirine several years back. And, and really, we must remember there are some three drug regimens with a lower barrier to resistance than some of our more recent two drug options. Early virologic failure, the key things here, why did virologic failure occur? A careful review of adherence and the patient beliefs and understanding about treatment, drug interactions, including supplements, food requirements, other social barriers, and a careful review of history and resistance in case something's been missed. In terms of resistance testing, DHHS specify that should be on the failing regimen or within four weeks of stopping so that you don't risk that resistance disappearing back into the background. In the absence of resistance, still consider switch to a higher barrier regimen, but if there is resistance, then tailor treatment accordingly. And in general, if you look at the guidelines, it's tenofovir, lamivudine or emtricitabine, and a second generation integrasal boosted PI that's recommended at virologic failure. DHHS specifies adding a single drug is not recommended. We'll come back to that. Now, the classic study here, I think, is Nadia taking people on failing to nofavir, amifudine or emtricitabine with an NNRTI, randomizing them to dolutegravir or darunavir and then zidovudine or tenofovir. So one group continuing that failing backbone, another group switching to zidovudine, amifudine. At 96 weeks, dolutegravir non-inferior to darunavir with actually numerically lower rates of virologic failure. But the difference at week 48 has amplified somewhat in that amongst the virologic failures on darunavir, no protease resistance, but amongst the virologic failures on dolutegravir, integrase resistance did develop in 45% of the virologic failures, which is 3.5% of the dolutegravir treated population overall. Backbones, there was no significant difference at week 48, but by week 96, zidovudine inferior. So carrying on that failing backbone was superior to switching, even in people with a K65R. Better rates of suppression, lower rates of virologic failure, but also a sense in the context of integrase resistance that tenofovir may be protected with lower numbers on tenofovir getting integrase resistance and it being intermediate rather than high level. But of course, these numbers are small. So Nadia tells us a second generation integrase or certainly dolutegravir is almost equivalent to a boosted PI, and in terms of virologic efficacy overall, non-inferior. So I think it's very likely that we can say the same in the context of suppressed switch. Nadia also tells us that switching tenofovir and mivudine to the same backbone with dolutegravir or darunavir is a good sequencing option, which actually suggests that adding or changing one drug may not be so bad after all. Later lines of failure, again, it's back to basics. Basic principles, adherence, drug interactions, and all the things that we covered in early failure, stopping drugs with a high risk of cumulative resistance, so limiting more resistance development that may impact later drugs in those given classes, and particularly NNRTIs and first-generation integrases.
resistance testing, considering tropism, whether or not marafrock might be useful. And if somebody has less than one fully active high barrier drug, then aiming for three fully active drugs in the regimen. Remembering NRTI resistance is relative and people can do very well on two NRTIs and a high barrier drug, even with quite extensive NRTI resistance. But considering trials, novel agents and compassionate access, but remembering new drugs might not have high barriers. So lenacapavir, a drug that yields really impressive results in highly treated and experienced people, appears to have a relatively low barrier to resistance. So protecting those new drugs, and if you're thinking about using one investigational drug, you may need to think about using two. Closing thoughts. Now, at global level, I think the rollout of CAB for PrEP could be game changing. And certainly the modelling in the WHO guidelines predicts a 27% reduction in new HIV diagnoses and a reduced total number of people living with HIV. But the consequence will be an increase in the absolute number of people with integrase resistant, integrase resistant HIV. That's predicted to be half a percent without LA CAB, but 7% by 2030 if LA CAB is rolled out. Despite this, the overall net impact would be reduced mortality, which is clearly a good thing. Adherence, and one of my concerns about rapid or same day art is are we neglecting the opportunity to counsel people fully and prepare them for lifelong adherence? So ensuring always that we're supporting people to take art in the right way at the right time, supported by the right information is critical. And I think if you listen to people, there's almost always something that you can address if they're describing adherence challenges. So flipping the responsibility of the poorly adherent patient to us and focusing on poor management maybe will change things around. I shall finish there. Thank you for your kind attention and here are my contact details.